What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go back in time to November 8th, 1866 to look at one of the oldest American math tests that I could find on the internet. So here we go. Okay, so we're back in the 1800s, so now let's take a look at this test. Now, as we start this test, remember, it's November 8th, 1866, so we do not get to use a calculator for this test. Now, we're just going to sketch out each question here. If one question is really interesting, we will solve it all the way through, but we just want to get a feel for what were these questions like. So first up here, write in figures each of the following numbers, add them, express in words or numerate their sum. So we have 56,000 and 14 thousandths. So let's see, 56,000 and 14 thousandths. And then we have... 19 and 19 hundredths. So 19 and 19 hundredths. So this just seems like we're turning these numbers from word form into number form. We're going to add them and then we're going to write that answer in words. So not too crazy difficult, but definitely a bit tedious. Second question here, what is the difference between this mixed number plus this mixed number and this whole number plus this mixed number? So this is just basic operations, adding and subtracting mixed numbers. So not too terrible. So this is an okay start. Now three, in multiplying by more than one figure, where is the first figure in each partial product written and why is it so written? So this one, the wording right away, I'm just looking at that and it's throwing me off. I would wanna reread this, but it's making me think of place value. And so place value maybe, and let's say I did something like, let's say 72 times 13. I know that when we're doing the partial product, this is kind of explaining the process behind long multiplication, that when you multiply the ones place together and you start you know, working this out, that by the time you get to the next row, you've got to put a placeholder here because now you're multiplying from the tens place. So the partial products is making me think of the distributive property. So place value and distributive property, it's a nice question because it's emphasizing the idea behind why multiplication works when you're doing more than one figure. Um, unless they were saying here, multiply just more than two numbers together, but that was my initial take here. All right, question four, if the divisor is 19 and the quotient 37 and the remainder 11, what is the dividend? All right, so for one, you have to know vocabulary here. Dividend is the thing you're dividing. So let's say our dividend is X. We're dividing by 19 and they're telling us the quotient is 37 plus we have a remainder of 11. But remember, if we're dividing by 19, our remainder is gonna be over what we divided by. So for this one, I would just multiply everything by 19. And you might've just been able to do this all at once but 19 over 19 would cancel. This would tell you the mystery value X is we do 19 times 37. So 37 times 19. And then we add, if I do 19 times 11 over 19, that's just 11. So 37 times 19 plus 11 would be our answer. And this is something, of course, we could check. All right, moving on to question five here. What is the quotient of 65 BU, 1 PK, 3 maybe quarts divided by 12? So here, my... I'm just thinking units, like what are these units? I have no idea. Maybe they'll be nice and give you a conversion chart back then, but probably not. Um, but today, this is interesting because this is the kind of question that you get asked today on an algebra regions, at least in New York. But this is something that held the test of time. But I just have no idea what these units are because it is the 1800s. And I'm sure uh, a lot of stuff from the 1800s just became obsolete. So question six, which one of the fundamental operations or ground rules of arithmetic is employed in reduction descending. Yeah, I, I'm looking at that reduction descending. I just have no idea what that means. So I would just have to learn that. Like what is reduction descending? And then show me the technique. I practice it until I get good at it. And I would dig into why does the process work. So that's just the process of learning anything in math. But yeah, my first reaction here is just what on earth is reduction descending? I do not know. In exchanging gold dust for cotton, by what weight would each be weighed? So for this one, once again, units, I don't know what the value of gold dust is. What was interesting to learn, I did a little bit of reading, is that gold dust was one of the main forms of currency, at least in the Idaho region in the 1860s and 1870s. When paper currency was introduced, there was a lot of skepticism over it. People really wanted to stick to the gold standard. They felt that the gold standard was just the way. So that was just interesting to learn. Like, oh, wow, gold dust was just a form of currency back then. All right, question eight. What is the only even prime number? So you should know the prime numbers here. The first prime number is two, and that is the only even prime number. But if we start listing the other primes, we have two, three, five, seven, don't say nine, 11, and it goes on like this. But we want just the only prime, the only even prime number, which in this case 
is two. So that, if you know your prime numbers, this is not bad. This question is still fair by today's standards. So how many weeks are there in this many minutes? Well, one thing you should know is that there are 60 minutes in an hour, there's 24 hours in a day, and there's seven days in a week. So for this one, it looks like here you would just be dividing by 60. I'm not going to write the units canceling here because we're going to run out of space, but you divide by 60, that would tell you how many hours you have. Then you divide by 24, that'll tell you how many days. And then you divide by seven, and that'll tell you how many weeks you have. So this just converting units. So units seems to be a really big idea on this arithmetic test. Okay, so to what term in division does the value of a common fraction correspond? So anytime I think of division, I think of what we have here. Up top is the quotient. So this is the quotient. What we have inside here is the dividend. So this is the thing that we're dividing into. And then in front you have the divisor. Okay, so the divisor. So if you have some common fraction, like one over three, this corresponds to one divided by three. So I guess the result of this would be the quotient. But this is really just a vocab question here. And yeah, so know your vocabulary. This is not necessarily the answer, but that's the sense I'm getting when we first look at this. So 11, what is the product of a fraction multiplied by its denominator? Ooh, all right, that's an, uh, an okay question. So let's say I had five over seven. So let's make that neater. So five over seven, and we multiply by seven. If we multiply by the denominator, this will cancel out and we'll have just five. So the product of a fraction multiplied by its denominator, denominator is just the numerator. Okay, that gets the numerator by itself. So very cool. So they're like just, once again, testing you more on the process and then, hey, create an example. So that's some high level stuff here. They were really setting the bar high back then. So what is the rule for multiplication of decimals? Well, I guess you could describe the technique here, but if I had to do something like, let's say I did 0.12 times 0.13. So I know 12 times 13 is 156. So what I would have here is I would have one, five, six, but what I did here was I ignored four decimal places. So you see there are one, two, three, four decimal places that I ignored. So I'd have to pay that back. I'd have to go one, two, three, and now I put a zero here and go one more like this. So it'd be 0 0.0156. So I guess just explain the process, like multiply it as if they're whole numbers, and then just move the decimal place all from all the way to the right the amount of decimal places that you ignored towards the left and that is your answer so i guess that's just really testing you on the process and like what's the rule so rule process i'm hoping that's in the same neighborhood how is a common fraction reduced to a decimal so this just know the process if we were to continue on this example three goes into one zero times and then you carry your decimal and just add a bunch of zeros three goes into ten three times and three times three is nine. You have a remainder of one, you bring down the zero, three goes into 10, three times. This process will continue. So just know the process for dividing and turning a fraction into a decimal using long division. So let's see, next up here, what is ratio and how may it be expressed? A ratio is a comparison of two numbers by division. You could express it a few ways. You could say the ratio uh, two to three here could be expressed this way, or it could be expressed as two over three as a fraction. So question 15, more units, 27 tons, three, whatever QR is, 15 pounds of coal cost this much. What will uh, 119 tons, one QR and 10 pounds cost? So for this one, I would convert the first one here all into let's say pounds. So once I know like how many pounds we have, like X pounds, and uh, we have X pounds, and I'll write it underneath this. I would say, all right, there's X pounds, so if we do 217.83 divided by X, that'll tell us the unit rate. And then once we know the unit rate, we turn this into pounds and we multiply the unit rate by the number of pounds for the second part. And that'll give us our answer here. But once again, I don't know what these units are. So that seems to be a common struggle here from 2023 going back to 1866. So let's see here. Find the cost of the several articles and the amount of the following bill. It is 16,750 feet of board at 1250 per M. I don't know what M is, so I will not be able to answer this. Once again, the units are really just throwing me off here. So now let's move on. What is the length of a cubical box which contains 389,017 solid inches? Okay, so for this one, what I'm imagining here is we're taking the cube root of this number, but how do we do this without a calculator? Oh no. So what I'm paying attention to here is the seven. And I look at my perfect cubes. So I have one to the third power is one. Two to the third power is eight. 3 to the third power is 27. Okay, so you see how this ends in 7? Like right away I'm thinking whatever the number is, it's going to end in 3. And if I really wanted to be sure, I could find the other perfect cubes here. So 4 to the third power is 64. 
5 to the third power. These quickly get out of control is 125. 6 to the third power is 216. 7 to the third power, I believe that's 343. Let me double check though. So that would be 49 times 7. So we have 63, carry the 6. This is going to be, yep, 343. So this question is interesting. So I definitely want to see this one through. 8 to the third power would be 512. And then 9 to the third power, 81 times 9 is 729. But let's just double check. 81 times 9 is, yep, 729. So notice that 3 to the third power is the only one that gives you a number that ends in 7. So if we use like kind of like a guess and check method here, let's start off now. Let's say I have 10 to the third power. That brings me to 1,000. And I'm looking at this and saying, wow, I'm really short of 389,000. So what if I did 100 to the third power? Well, that would be 100 times 100 times 100. And this, the trick is do 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. And I have six zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And notice what we have here. We have 1 million. So we went way too far. So now I would go somewhere in between. Let's say I did 500. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, not 500, 50. So our answer has to be between 10 and 100. So let's say I do 50 to the third power. So I just meant something with a five. So 50 times 50 times 50, that would give me five times five times five is 125. And now I have three zeros. So I'm at 125,000. So now let me try 70. 70 to the third, I would have, and let's make that a little bit neater. So we have 70 to the third power. I'm doing seven times seven times seven, which is conveniently written here is 343. And I have three zeros. Oh, okay. So now we're in the neighborhood, but remember the number has to end in three. So now I'm going to try 73. So first we'll do 73 times 73. So we have 73 times 73. We'll do the long multiplication. We have so 5,329. So I'm going to take 5,329 and we're going to multiply that by 73. We get 389,017. So the length of the cubicle box is going to be 73 and solid inches, I'm guessing now, back then meant cubic inches, but 73 inches would be the length of the side. So this guess and check method wasn't too terrible because the answer was a whole number. But if it was a decimal or something, I don't know how we would do that without a calculator. So 18, what is the present worth of the following note discounted at, at the bank? When will it become due? Blah, blah, blah. Let's see, 90 days from date for value. Uh, yeah, the wording back then is just very different. English has definitely changed a bit, like the way they structure sentences. So this is just immediately throwing me off. I promise to pay to the order of John Smith $100 at Albany City. Yeah, so this one, um, I would say here, discounted, uh, note discounted at the bank is just uh, probably some basic arithmetic that I'm missing out on. But the, the language is what's throwing me off. So now let's see, involve five eighths to the seventh power. That's an interesting way to phrase it. Five eighths to the seventh power. All right, so just multiply until you're tired um, is the theme for this. So just multiply. And then 20, what is the square root of, ooh. All right, yeah, this one, I just, there has to be a technique. There's definitely a technique for finding square roots, no calculator. Um, I could imagine the cube root one, there's maybe a nice technique for that too. That's probably insane. Uh, but this one, we can't just guess and check. You'll be there for a really, 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 really long time. Um, so just looking at that, yeah, is uh, is not polite. Um, but I would have to learn the technique. So right now I'm going to say, yeah, question mark. I, I don't know how to do this. I would have to learn the technique, practice it, understand why it works. And then I'd be able to give it another go. All right, sold nine and one six, whatever this unit is. Yeah, so once again, I'm just saying units. I don't know the units here. So I need to learn that. A person owned five eighths of a mine okay so five eighths and sold three three fourths of his interest but the interest sounds like the profit made but maybe back then that meant something different so what i'm thinking here is 15 over 32 is how much was sold for 1710 so 15 over 32 of the total cost equals 1710 so just multiply both sides by 32 over 15 is my you know um best you know idea for how to approach this, but could be wrong here. Um, there might be something that I'm missing out on. All right, next up here, when it's 2.36 a.m. at the Cape of Good Hope in longitude. All right, so this is globe stuff that I'm not too familiar with. Um, I would have to brush up for sure, but it's time zones plus globes. You have to know, I guess, which time zone you're in and then you know, add or subtract however many hours and minutes you're ahead or behind. Um, at Cape Horn in longitude. Yeah, so I would have to brush up on this. I don't know, and I don't know the time zones by heart. So I, yeah, this question, I'm just not too sure. What is the cost of 17 tons? Yep, there's the units again. 
don't know the units for this, um, but unit conversion seems to be a massive idea. Well, thank you for going back to 1866 with me. Let me know which question you thought was the most challenging question on this test. And also, if there's anything that I didn't explain all the way through, and you happen to know some of those mystery units, let us know in the comments section below. And thanks for watching.